Art Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark, presented by Weird Darkness. Each week, I bring you a show from the golden age of radio, but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Spreading the word about the show helps it to grow. If you're here because you're already a fan of nostalgic audio and print, you'll want to email WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. When you do that, you'll get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows for free. That's WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com. Coming up, it's an episode from Crime Classics. Crime Classics was a radio docudrama on the CBS radio network, which was aired for just one year, from June 15, 1953 to June 30, 1954. The show introduced itself succinctly. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. And they meant it. The show examined real crimes from as far back as ancient Greece up to the late 19th century. The cases ranged from famous assassinations like Abraham Lincoln, Leon Trotsky, and Julius Caesar to the lives and often deaths of the likes of Caesar Borgia and Blackbeard, like we'll hear tonight, and the more obscure cases such as Bathsheba Spooner, who killed her husband Joshua Spooner in 1778 and became the first woman tried and executed in America. And no matter how bizarre the story presented, each episode is based on actual events. Your host each week was Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. In reality, though, Mr. Thomas Highland didn't exist. He was simply a character played by actor Lou Merrill, though you'd never guess it just from listening. The character is treated like a real person. The show was produced, created, and directed by Elliot Lewis, with the writing of every episode done by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness as we listen to Crime Classics from November 11, 1953, and an episode entitled Blackbeard's 14th Wife and Why She Was No Good For Him. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's a pair of scissors, hand wrought in gold in the shape of a peacock. The young lady who's using them is trimming her husband's beard. The beard has just been washed to get the blood out of it. For a few hours ago, out on the bounding main, her husband stabbed a few fellows from up close. And the beard has been perfumed, too, to get the gunpowder and sulfur smells out of it, because there's just been a battle. And now the beard is being trimmed uh, before curling, because her husband is very vain about his beard. It is a black beard, which caused some 18th century pundit to dub him Blackbeard. His real name, Edward Teach. Profession, pirate. His wife, Hannah. Hannah's all done. The beard's all ready for curling. Such a good wife. Oh, no, she wasn't. Tonight, my report to you on Blackbeard's 14th wife. Why, she was no good for it. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land and every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Thomas Highland. <laughs> The 
year of 1714. The place is the Caribbees. Two vessels locked in combat. One flying the skull and bones. The other, the three penitent gonfalon of the Duc de la San Alban. The very Duc de la San Alban who boasted to history that his 40-gun vessel La Panc would never be boarded by pirates. Well, it was, wasn't it? And the Duke, he was defending himself against a pirate, Edward Teach by name, and here's what was happening. Teach had just disengaged into the cart line. The Duke parries hot. There goes Teach into the Valestra, calculated to throw the Duke off balance, but the Duke parries, goes into a doublé, a Molinet now, lunge, parry, and Teach faints in the advance one, two, lunges. And the Duke goes down without a sound. Which, as you will recall, is the way the Duke swore he would die. So Edward Teach and his pirates won the prize La Panc, renamed it Queen Anne's Revenge, and sailed disguised as Merchant Man into Jamaica. Here, in a small waterfront cafe, uh, he made friends. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, let's drink a toast, eh, Captain? Hey, I'll make you one. I drink to Captain Edward Teach. <laughs> to yourself, Captain? The Captain Edward Teach, whose name's going to be known about. <laughs> what a one you are. You shot my Captain. Or I let what you drunk out again. To Captain Edward Teach. <laughs> I need me a mate. You be mate to Captain Teach. Aye. <laughs> That's how Edward Teach got a first mate. His name was Kerf, and you might like to know that later in his career, Kerf struck out on his own, his own vessel, crew, and Jolly Roger. But Kerf, in his very first encounter with a Britisher, got pinned to the mast by a cutlass. So we know that his period of association with Teach was happier than when he worked for himself. Teach and Kerf sailed from Jamaica, where they'd met, to Nassau. On the way... <laughs> And they captured the sloop Invincible, threw all her hands to the sharks, took aboard her booty, then scuttled her. And in Nassau, on the silver sands of Nassau, when the silver moon was younger than it is now... Oh, it's so silky. <laughs> and curls and, oh, and beautiful. Some call me Blackbeard. Blackbeard. Well... The name is that. Hannah. Oh, so silly. How many years have you, Hannah? Enough to let the wisdom in. Of what? Of men. Yes, even men with black beards. <laughs> but none such as mine. Huh? None, sir. It is true. How many years have you, Hannah? Actual years. Six and ten. Yeah. Well, your wife to me. Such as you, and you have no wife. Here I have no wife in the Bahamas. But elsewhere? <laughs> Mary, Genevieve, Margot, Prudence, Molly, Sharon. How many? Thirteen. Thirteen, Anna. A number which is not lucky. And this is the reason you wish to wife me? Uh, the touch you have with my beard. I'd lonely for it. I'll marry with you, but... But what? This pirating of yours... What of it? You play at it. I'll play. You'll be one of, of many pirates, small men with small wants and small names. Do you not wish a large name? Some call me Blackbeard. Then make the most of it. <laughs> what do you know of pirates? Look, look to me. And? Now fan out your beard. So. And in braids over your ears. So. And punk to light among its silk. And under your hat, lighted matches. Oh, what a fearsome thing. What terror could you conjure, black beard of Hades? Well, well, what think you? <laughs> I would kiss you. Then do it. Oh, and now I wish, a wish to make. Woman, a wedding wish, that's what. 
Yes. Then name it. Shall I? The highest star that sends a glimmer on, yours. The moon that orbs a silver on darkened sea, yours. And the sun that... Oh, Pooh. What? Pooh, I said. I wish none of these. <laughs> then what? This island. This Nassau. <laughs> what, laughter? <laughs> that you have but 16 years and such a dream. This island. I want it. And you shall have it. Now. Later. What manner of rapscallions be you two? When my mate has a craving for an apple, he has no care whose table it is off, nor yours, the governor's. And I sentence both of you to the gibbet. Uh, for eating an apple? For murder. For the murder of my guard. It was the only way we could get to see you. Oh? And what profession do you have? Besides rapscallery, that is. Piracy. What say you? <laughs> Having finished of the apple, my mate says piracy. And I say it twice. I sentence the two of you to the gibbet. Guards, take these two rags to hang Haste on Haste not, Governor. Oh? Haste not, because I say... Saying? I am here on an errand of romance. I am here on an errand of beauty. Oh? I have this morning been wed to a girl of ten and six. <laughs> I fight back the salty tears. You will weep. Make me weep, condemned man. Aye. This girl of ten and six, she wishes a wedding gift. How like a maiden? She wishes this island, this city, and all that's in it. Then I will instruct Hangman to hang thee by a rapid method he knows, so thy bride cannot ask thee for the world. Just this island, and she will have it. Oh? Oh, indeed, if my calculations are correct. What say you, mate? Take these clowns and... What is this? Go to the window and you will see it, Governor. Four sloops there are of yours in the harbor. They will die there. My vessel, Queen Anne's Revenge, and the men that's on will sink your ships and block your harbor and hold captive your city. Say ho, Governor, so long as your mouth is open. Say ho and believe it. I'll get you to the window and look. Oh! The governor then gave apples to everybody. Everybody except Edward Teach. Him, he gave the Bahama Islands. It was a good thing, too, else Nassau would have been put to the torch. All the pirates enjoyed this state of affairs very much. No wonder. Let us look in on a typical week in the life of Blackbeard's pirates. Monday, leave Nassau and pick up the trade winds, straddle the Gulf Stream someplace, and wait for a prey. Then... Frenchman to starboard! Then... Then... Hand me my beard and hair matches. Then... How do I look? <laughs> Terrifying. The French will quiver in their silk. And then... And Blackbeard never lost a fight. True, some of his men would get killed and have to be given to the sea, but the survivors never had it so good. Like as not, they were back in Nassau by Friday night. And there were welcome arms to greet them, with Caribbean poultices to soothe their wounds. And on Saturday night, what they liked to do best was pay homage to their leader. I give you Captain Edward Teach. I give you Blackbeard, whose name is known about. <laughs> oh, they love you so much, Edward. And this place. Oh, it's a pity. What is? Walk with me, Edward, outside a while. Yes. I said, Edward, that it's a pity. And I ask, what is? That we shall leave here soon. About these six months, you... You notice that less and less ships appear? Aye, that is so. But this, there are many ships along the Carolina coast. Aye, and so? Many ships which carry provisions and stores to the colonies. And many ships bearing riches back to Europe in return. <laughs> You're a bright tackling. Good wife to you. I, I indeed. Wait. Wait? Will we do it? Will we go to the Carolines? <laughs> but Nassau, this I gave to you and hardly have you used it. I've used it enough. Now the Carolines. <laughs> if you wish it. I wish it. Yes. 
good wife. Oh, silky beard. Mm, curl some silky black beard. They sailed a week later, and the night before they disembarked on the shores of North Carolina, Blackbeard and his pirate crew gave Mrs. Blackbeard a party on her birthday. She was ten and seven. listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Dramatic actors play comedy roles, comedians interpret the drama. This Friday night, as CBS Radio's Stage Struck introduces that exclusive theatrical fraternity, The Players. Participants will be Franklin P. Adams, Gene Hirschholt, Jimmy Cagney, Ray Bolger, Bobby Clark, Charles Coburn, Cedric Hardwick, Bert Lahr, Charles Lawton, and hosts more of The Players. It's Friday night on CBS Radio's Stage Struck, now heard half an hour later on most of these same stations. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on Blackbeard's 14th wife, why she was no good for him. I would like to say a few words about governors. New world governors, vintage, early 1700s. First of all, I would like to say that many of them had brothers-in-law back in England at court, uh, connections. Or else they had won an important battle, or took part in an important scandal. Or they were just fellows who the king or queen didn't want in the old country anymore. Some of the colonial governors of this era were wise and intelligent administrators. But others were cheaters, uh, that is, uh, thieves, uh, that is... They stole their colonies blind. Let us then look in on a scene. The governor of North Carolina and Edward Teach, pirate, standing in the reception room of the governor's mansion with their arms about each other's shoulders. I, uh, hear they call you Blackbeard. Yes. I hear you stick lighted matches in your beard and in your hair. Yes. <laughs> Just don't do it when I'm around. Just don't go to sea, Governor. Why should I? It's good here in North Carolina, isn't it? Oh, better. Since you surrendered to me, the people cheer me when I walk the streets. And they cheer me, too, since you issued the writ granting amnesty to me and my men. It's a good feeling. Worth a thousand gold pieces you paid me? <laughs> my wife said you would have been satisfied with 500. How is your wife? Very good. <laughs> she was right. <laughs> Pirates. <laughs> Governor Call me pirate again Pirate <laughs> Sea robber <laughs> Swashbuckler <laughs> <laughs> Listen Yes Let's conspire Again? Again Ooh. The men are restless, they're grumbling Oh? They want to go to sea again And they want a good fat galleon to plunder Yes the vessel Angel's Head is due to arrive about a week from now, from Portsmouth. Oh? Yeah. Carrying what? Sugar, gold, silt, and two ladies from the court. A week from now? Yes. And Captain Teach. Aye. Uh, the two ladies from the court. One of them is Lady Barbara Falmer. You must know why she's leaving England. <laughs> As I heard. But it's true, every word of it. And Captain. Aye. Of the rest of the booty. <laughs> 50% now. Like always. Like always. I'll walk with you to the door. Blackbeard went immediately then to the den where his pirates were grumbling and told them the news. They stopped grumbling, hailed him a merry, merry, merry lad and sharpened their cutlasses. A few days later, they put to sea and... The results of which, sugar, gold, silk confiscated, two ladies of the court never heard of again, and the ship Angel's Head put to the torch. 
This was just about the way things went. A chat with the governor. The ship Las Flores from Lisbon, due in a fortnight, Captain. Tell the boys. <laughs> Put to sea and... <laughs> then... Half for you, Governor. Half for me. And once, after a particularly successful sortie... <laughs> half for you, Governor. Half for me. <laughs> Tonight we shall have a ball. Good. Bring your wife. I will. <laughs> Yes. Would you care to meet him? Well... My husband's a big man and a strong man. Are you frightened to meet him, Lieutenant? I would very much like to meet your husband. Where is he? He... He was standing there a moment ago, speaking with the governor's lady. Then another time. Come. We will look for him. Really? Come. Very well. But that was your husband who we saw pass us and uh, go toward the... Uh... Hush. Why did you not call out to him then? Hush. Really? Bend to me. Really? Yes. Very well. Oh, how soft is your cheek. Soft and beardless. Your husband's beard is truly magnificent. It reeks either of battle tar or perfume. I cannot stand it. Really? Really. Mrs. Teach. If you say it softly, you may say Hannah. Hannah. Just so. How many years have you? Ten and eight. I have twenty and one. You bend to me again the softness of your cheek. I want to. Oh, so young. As you are young. Hold me. I want to. Hannah? Yes. No, what I mean is, where does your husband hide his ship? What? I am curious of it. Where does he hide his ship? In the province of Friendship, the third inlet off the river. Why? I was curious of it. Do you have a curiosity? About all things. About me? Yes. Oh, yes. I hate the governor of North Carolina. Of course you do. So listen to me, Lieutenant Maynard. Before I was governor of Virginia back in England, do you know what he did to me? Well, I heard... You he... heard? How did you hear? The governor of North Carolina, he tells I everyone... I hate him! He... And he shall have his due. Yes. When word gets back to England that his river harbors the notorious pirate Blackbeard... And that the governor shares the pirate's booty... All I need is two sloops, governor. And you shall have them. And the reward. What reward? Bring me the head of Blackbeard and name your reward. Really? Really. Thank you, Governor. Anna. Yes, Edward? I'm tired. You don't look well, Edward. I mean, I'm tired of this life. Of piracy, of slaughter... Come to the bow of the ship. I want to show you something. Look there. And to see what? The land. What of it? The governor has promised me all the land from my vessel at anchor as center and ten miles in radius out from it in the form of a circle. What do you think? Oh, you are tired, Edward. You're somehow older. Yes, to me, older. And your beard. What of it? Gray. Uh, where? Here, and here, and here. What? 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 What was that? Two shrooms! Men of war! Stop it! Flying the royal flag! Come in this way! Front side! Now, 
this is what happened. Maynard's two sloops closed on Blackbeard, one on each side of Teach's vessel. And the three ships were held together by grappling hooks. And it was a furious sight. There was not one man on either side who did not receive some mark, who did not add some of his blood to the slippery decks. Then Blackbeard was boarded midst a hail of grape shot in which Blackbeard received three pellets in his leg. Maynard found the pirate leaning against the mainmast. Shot him. Hey! Die, pilot! Not yet! Of a two and no quarter! And the men fell back to watch their captain's duel. It was a wonderful duel, and it lasted over an hour. And toward the end of it, Maynard Dublade then advanced in Cona de Cis Cart Cis. Teach Parry then performed a striking Molinet and lunged into the cart line. Lunged and slipped. Slipped, yet on his knees parried Maynard once, twice, but the third time. Teach was dead, and the duel was over. And so was the battle, for Blackbeard's men had no heart for it anymore. Lieutenant Maynard, having declared himself victor and new master of Blackbeard's boat, went below into the pirates' quarters. Hannah. Oh, my darling. Get up, Hannah. Oh, bend your cheek to me. I don't want to. What? Come on deck, Hannah. For what reason? Wife of a pirate and his spur. For what reason do you want me on deck? To be hanged. Really? Upon my word. And this is what Lieutenant Maynard did to the Teach family. He wrecked it. He hanged Hannah Teach, and he cut off Edward Teach's head. The head he mounted on the prow of the ship and sailed it proudly into Roanoke Harbor, tacking beautifully in such a manner that the black beard of Edward Teach streamed gracefully on the soft evening wind. A gull soared down to have a look, but when it saw what it was, it screamed and flew away. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Blackbeard's 14th Wife, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. And the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, William Conrad was heard as Teach, Betty Harford as Hannah, and Alastair Duncan as Maynard. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Joseph Kearns, Richard Peel, and Jack Crucian. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Camelot, England, in the year 600. And the troubles caused by Guinevere, who was married to Arthur and loved by Lancelot. My report to you will be on the triangle on the round table. Thank you. Good night. America's favorite teenage rage, Junior Miss now brings us her haphazard adventures every Thursday evening on most of these same stations. That makes her a perfect listening companion to Millie Bronson, heroine of CBS Radio's wacky Thursday night series titled Meet Millie. In moving to Thursday evenings, Junior Miss also keeps company with Ray Milland of Meet Mr. McNutley comedy fame. Tomorrow night, don't miss Milland with a teenage problem of his own in the shapely shape of a visiting niece and her strange young swain. Tomorrow night, at the star's address. <laughs> Hear the American Way, starring Horace Height, Thursday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Thanks for listening to this week's Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. If you haven't done so yet, 
Be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you like the show, please share it with someone you know who also loves old-time radio and pulp audio. If you want to hear even more, drop an email to weirddarkness at radioarchives.com and get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows absolutely free. That's weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. I'm Darren Marlar. I'll see you next time for Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark. Yeah.